I'm Kath McGuire. My colleagues and I are going to talk to you about co-producing citizen science and in particular what we needed to have in place in order to be able to work effectively in this field during COVID. Citizen science is often thought of in a very linear way as a sort of levels of involvement. This is a model by Assumptio and colleagues which measures the levels of involvement from simply using citizens as data gatherers through to collaborating with them to define the subject of the research, collecting data and jointly coming to understand what the data means. To some extent that model calls back to Sherry Arnstein's 1969 model of a ladder of citizen participation which runs from manipulation through to citizen control, dependent entirely on how much power the involved citizens have in the process. These models, which measure a single dimension of level of involvement or level of power, have been criticised for missing the complexity of the exchanges that take place within public engagement and involvement. This model was developed by Gibson, Britton and Lynch to describe patient and public involvement in health research. It has four dimensions and is therefore able to capture more of the complexity. The dimension of monism to pluralism is built on Bourdieu's idea of different types of capital. There's only one way to be involved that clearly will exclude and limit the engagement of people who haven't been socialised to being involved in that particular way. People whose skill sets are not suited to that type of activity. The dimension that runs from organisational concerns to public discussion speaks to Habermas's differentiation between instrumental and expressive ways of communicating. Are the ways that we communicate with the public relational or purely instrumental? The third dimension is based on Nancy Fraser's concept of a strong public versus a weak public. So are the public that we engage actually able to effect change? Or are they merely there to be placated? This is the dimension that I think probably cl most closely links to the Arnstein ladder. In this model, there is an overarching fourth dimension how effectively are the institutions that we work with able to respond to the demands of engaging and involving people across these different dimensions? My colleague Rita Alflat will now describe to you how we had tried to structure this into the way we work with researchers and publics in Cornwall and Plymouth. I'm Rita Alflat and I work closely with Kath in supporting HEPI. We work in a way that remains sensitive to the preferences of how people choose to be involved. For some, regular email correspondence works very well. For others, we send out material in the post or have a phone conversation. Keeping these different channels of communication open allows our work to be more inclusive. Equally, accessibility is at the forefront of our face-to-face -face activities. This goes beyond thinking about the locations we choose. By using materials such as Lego and Play-Doh in our activities, our aim is to make engaging with research more accessible. We've worked with photographers using smartphones and tablets to explore how engaged research can be expressed more creatively. While the value our work brings to research is recognised widely, ensuring it is resourced appropriately remains a challenge. My name's Alex and I'm a PhD student at the University of Exeter. I've had the great pleasure of working with the Health and Environment Public Engagement Group 
um, on three studies in the last two years. And every time the insight, the enthusiasm, the dedication that HEPI have provided to the projects has enriched them immeasurably. Um, it's been amazing to talk through early study designs to get HEPI's input on the kind of questions they think we should, we should be asking right at the very beginning of the research design process so that we can ensure the questions that we ask um, and the insights which we're able to uncover actually mean something to real people in the real world. I'm Jo Poland. Prior to COVID, I was a very active coordinator, volunteer coordinator for butterfly conservation, doing practical conservation and monitoring butterflies and moths. I've been involved with so many different things with Pepe. It's hard to remember everything. But I think the highlights have been working with academics in fields that I knew nothing about, like virtual reality, done lots of work outside with community groups in areas where with children and young people um, and adults who don't experience nature normally in the way that one would possibly expect from people living in Cornwall. I respond to things a lot that is, are sent to us online. That's one of the benefits of HEPI. You don't have to be at every meeting or um, at every interaction. You, you can just dip in and out and nobody minds that. And I think that's one of its strengths. So if I get a moment and I've been sent something that one of the researchers wants feedback on, I can do it whenever I like. And um, I think that's a great benefit to me because I can volunteer in a way that suits me. When, when COVID hit, it was really, really frustrating, like it was for everyone to see everything that you've got planned just come to a complete halt. And I, I was really worried about what would happen to Happy because I didn't see that we would necessarily be able to run it effectively without meeting each other physically. But I was proved to be very wrong. We started meeting very regularly and different people came, different people contributed, things carried on. Cap has used the analogy of, you know, it's, it's a room and we're in and out of it and Zoom works just as well like that. But I do miss people. And I think perhaps in the future we would have a combination of meetings virtually and meeting physically. Um, hi there, my name's Carol Miller. I live in uh, the glorious county of Cornwall and I became involved in HEPI back in June of 2018. I find the subjects so interesting. From there, I had the opportunity to start going to conferences, co-presenting in respect of uh, what HEPI is about, what HEPI does, and the interactions between research proposals and ongoing research within the University of Exeter, and sometimes uh, further beyond that. I came away very inspired subsequently there was a need for a couple of lay members on the University of Exeter's Medical School Ethics Committee just before the initial uh, lockdown back in March last year. I proposed, if possible, to have the application forms and any other paperwork sent through to me and because I do have an ongoing eye condition, find it very difficult to read on the laptop. I was sent much stuff from the ethics committee and brought that to an online happy meeting and from there things are stuff is actually being sent out by post to me and I think also some other members of uh, HEPI. This has uh, enabled me to be very much uh, involved continually uh, to be involved with HEPI and also to attend all the online ethics committee meetings. My name's Mike Kent. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a marine biologist, a former, former teacher. It was well into lockdown that I joined the group and I think it helped all of us uh, to, uh, to retain some sort of social interaction. 
but we could do that in any any type of Zoom meeting. But I think it had a purpose to it as well. And I think because it had a purpose, it had greater value. And you felt that you were still contributing, still producing, still taking part. So um, I liked the fact that it was a mixed group of people from vastly different backgrounds with vastly different experiences that could make different contributions. I find that refreshing. We were, we were involved in a number of different projects at that time. And uh, each meeting, it was it, you weren't quite sure what you were going to be confronted with. But, uh, but I can remember some work on Alec, Alex Smalley's uh, project, of course, on, on soundscapes and the importance of soundscapes, natural soundscapes to psychological well-being. And we started talking about various other things and various other projects. And we were talking about the harmful effects of social isolation during uh, COVID-19. And then I think it evolved from that with inputs from, from everyone. So it was one of those things which is great because you aren't quite sure where the ideas came from. The particular citizen science project that we were looking at um, fits in quite nicely because of the uh, Pulseth Marine Conservation Group that I'm involved in. And uh, they are very much involved in, in conservation activities. So it's, it's that connection between the Pulseth Marine Group and scientists and HEPI, which I thought was very good. I think this is a model. You've got citizen science in one part of a triangle, you have the scientists, and actually HEPI is a part of that, I think, part of the triangle as well, because HEPI acts as the connecting point between the scientists and the community. So there were multiple ways of HEPI members keeping in touch through the lockdown, by post, by email, and by phone, as well as frequent online meetings, which replaced the previous pattern of quarterly meetings and half-day workshops. This not only provided researchers like Alex with forums in which to discuss their research ideas, the frequency of online meetings enabled different types of discussions that started to join the dots between projects researchers were bringing to the group and the interests the group had linked to their own community activities. From this, we co-produced this model of co-benefits of engaged research for communities, for individuals and for science. This is being used as a framework for developing projects in partnership between academics and community organisations. Our work with HEPI, using multiple different ways of engaging and involving people, with different levels of control in different projects or parts of projects, as well as providing open forums for them to discuss their own ideas, demonstrates the value of thinking beyond linear models of public engagement and thinking about how to create and sustain knowledge spaces that work across projects and over time. HEPI's experience of this process has called into question Arnstein's categorisation of therapy as a form of non-participation. Here's Mike. I think one of the most important aspects of the group is that the views of each member is valued. It's not just a talking shop. It's not just people getting on their soapboxes. And I think every member of that group, no matter what their background, feels very much valued. Each of us are individuals. We have our own psychological well-being needs. And there's absolutely no doubt that this group has contributed to the well-being of those members during the lockdown. We've had a lot of feedback from every individual there and some quite moving ones where people have said they would not have been able to get through the, the lockdown if it weren't for those weekly connections because for some people it happened to be the only connections. Now the interesting aspect is if you just had a group meeting each week with no purpose it would not have that impact. It would be just, you're doing it for your well-being, but we're not doing it for that. We're doing it for other people's well-being. I think that's the key.